I mean, I got necked four times in the academy at Bristol. I was on the only player I think ever in rugby to have a good behaviour bonus in their contract. Eddie rang me and went, Ginch, no, this is, mate. And I was like, no, Eddie fucking Jones. And I was like... Uh, but I don't like some of the things that Clive Woodward write. Yeah, you're not alone there, mate. I just see red when I go on the pitch and I was so angry and, and ferocious and I was, I was getting scraps in, in games and... Do you think rugby's got a bit of a class problem? It's definitely got a class problem, yeah. Yeah. What this... do you mean by that? This is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So on this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up under proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way, but more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, a top England rugby international who in recent times won the Premiership title with Leicester Tigers, before returning to his roots with Bristol. His rise comes via an unconventional rugby beginnings. Overcoming personal and social challenges, he's gone on to become a leader for club and country. Chris Genge, welcome to Upfront. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you. We share two passions we've just been discussing with them. We <laughs> yeah, very old Paddle passion. tennis, but more importantly, the specials yeah. and ska music. That's music to my ears, that was, mm. because ultimately <laughs> I'm a big specials fan. As I was telling you off air, you know, I was very much involved in the reformation of the band. So it's really nice to meet someone that actually appreciates my endeavours of getting them back together again. That's it. But it was your dad, wasn't it? Yeah, my old man's into it. Yeah, big, uh, loves it. Loves everything to do with ska. Fantastic music, wasn't it? Yeah. Listen, Ellis, in these discussions that we have with all you elite athletes, one of the things that we try to get to understand is kind of the journey that you've been on and what took you and what made you do the things that you've done. But like boxing, rugby sort of intrigues me because you guys are in the hurt business. And so there's a lot of synergies. And one of the things that the boxers all seem to come from was a background of adversity and challenges and difficulties in their childhood. Looking at your backgrounds, you come from what seems to be a slightly challenged background, primarily because of maybe your behavior and some of the way you viewed the world. But just tell me a little bit about that background. So traditionally, you see, you see a lot of those stories. People are from broken homes. And, Single parent homes. Yeah, yeah exactly. My, my parents were together. Yeah. Um, by no means do we have it easy. And uh, we, we definitely aren't from a, from an affluent family and yeah. didn't have a penny to scratch our ass with. But I'm not from a broken home at all. Like my, my parents, are, the house was full of love and didn't have much. But yeah, we we, we had a blast. And um, yeah, I, I came from a place called Northwest West in Bristol. Mm -hmm. So back in the sort of uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, it was a bit of a torrid place to live right i'm a 95 child uh, although i look about 40 so um i, pro I probably miss the worst of of no the <clears throat> the area is sort of always predominantly white um my granddad's black right. um his dad came over from america because your, your mum's mixed heritage my mum's mixed yeah and your dad's white my yes. dad's white right. yeah skinhead big big scar man okay. um but um it, it wasn't easy but definitely not a traditional traditional rugby background well, the reason why i think i was picking up on that i think was possibly to do with your behavior i mean i was a rebellious sod i got kicked out of school when i was 16 years of age so you're, you're singing to the choir here but reading into your background about your challenges at school and looking like you don't like discipline you don't like authority you're a bit rebellious um and you're finding yourself on the cusp of potentially being accepted into school from what i can see only at certain times because you're handful is that is that a fair analysis yeah, or that, am I wrong? That's about right. So I went to a school called JCA. It, it was challenging for me because I come from Knoll. Right. And there was barely anyone who came from my side of town. I had to get an hour or so bus right. to get in in the mornings. And I was really out of my comfort zone. Yeah, so I just thought, fuck me, I don't really want a beer. But what's this, what's this about you didn't want... I mean, I'm reading a quote from you, which says, I didn't want anyone to help me. I didn't want to be part of anything. What's that about? I, I couldn't write. I'm dyspraxic, so my handwriting was awful. I found that out when I was 14, right. so uh, quite late on. So two years of school, the teachers thought, fuck me, this bloke just don't want to do any work. But it was actually because I, I wrote like three words per minute or something, which was awful. Um, so whenever teachers would come in and try and help me, I always felt, I always thought they were being condescending or, or patronizing and sort of taking a piss at me, I guess. And right. because obviously I'd experienced, I guess, a bit of, a bit of abuse in the, in the school life before coming to secondary school, I probably thought, fuck me, everyone's on my case again. And like my mum, my mum done a great job of keeping me in line in terms of like 
when I was in Noel growing up and that always corrected me. I, I was the only kid in the area that wasn't allowed out past seven o'clock right. until the eight. Do you know what I mean? So I was yeah, like, yeah. fuck me, why is everyone trying to pull me down? And the teachers were very different to me. I didn't have anyone that I could relate to in, in the slightest at the time. Um, and then when we became an academy, we actually brought in, which was the only black teacher at the school at the time called Lloyd right. Russell, who was a black belt in karate. He was a world champion actually. And um, he really helped me. He really helped me. And that was actually, ironically, when I got told I wasn't allowed to come in for half the day, but in the same breath, I actually started to enjoy it a lot more. Where was sport in this for you? Sport, I was playing, I started playing rugby, I think, year, year, year five, year six, or that? So what's that, 11? 11, yeah. yeah, I think. Loved it, to be fair, but I, I left school, which was where my friends were, in right. Noel. Um, and then I went to John Cabot. Right. So then I started playing football as a goalkeeper. I was, right. I was all right. I was all right. That's I got a man match in a play, game we lost 5 2. So yeah. That's uh, where they put the ones that can't play in it. Yeah, goal. exactly. Yeah. yeah. The people, I, my defender took my goal kicks, mate. Right. So that, that says everything you need to know, doesn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> I was that kid. So um, I, I pat football in and, and started playing rugby. I was a lot bigger than everyone and stronger. I was just more genetically yeah. advanced Built than everyone. Yeah, exactly. So um, I did that and a bit of shot put, so. Uh, Where was your parents in this? Was your father and your mother behind you in this? Did they look at this as something that yeah. A, you enjoyed, B, it kept you focused on something positive, and then C, A, there might be something in this for you? I don't think they thought I was gonna get a career until I was about 16, I'd say. Um, my mum always wanted me to be happy and I was happy when I was playing, you know, so. Yeah. And it, I think it brought discipline on Tuesdays, we'd train on the evening, so that'd keep me off the streets. Yeah. When all my mates were out causing mischief, I was at training. And then on Sundays as well, when you got fuck all to do and you go out, I was playing rugby. So, right. and it gave me something to get after. And I was, I was naturally quite lazy when I was younger. I didn't want to do much. I just wanted to go out with my mates and, and do whatever we were doing. And rugby, yeah, gave me a bit of direction, something to get after. And I think they seen that and they were incredible. My mum worked till six, she was an admin. And my old man self-employed plumber with the council and then became self-employed. So he was a bit more flexible. And he'd leave work early to come and drive me an hour to the other side. Uh, other side. But I missed a lot of training, naturally, because they were working all the time, whereas the other kids had the, uh, they were all at the same school, so they could uh, share lifts and all that. What you said a moment ago about at 16, you started to realise there might be an opportunity. What was it about 16 that, that, that was defining in your mind as saying, oh, hang on a second, I'm 16. Is it because you got picked up by a club? Is mm. it what happened at 16 that started to define in your mind? I left Cleveland when I was 15, went to Cainton when I was 16. I was playing centre at the time and I'm a prop now. So the disparity between the two is uh, very different. Like I said, I was athletic, I was fast. Yeah. I scored five tries in the Somerset Cup final, um, which to be fair, I want the best standard. But off the back of that, I think there was a scout there, put me forth for Southwest trials. I got into Southwest and there was 23 people in the squad, or maybe 24. But I remember they actually extended the squad size because they were like well, you're not in but we think we see something so we're going to bring you so then it became i don't know 25 or 24 players so i got in um got in like last second they sent me an email saying you're not supposed to be in but you're in thanks like made yeah. me feel great about myself yeah. do you know what i mean we stayed there I had to stay away from home for one night and play these trial games and uh oh it was horrible it was horrible didn't uh didn't get on with anyone um Hated it. And then I didn't get into the England 16 set up off the back of that. And I thought, fuck me, my world's over. Right. So I went and hit the bricks with my old man for the summer, um, working for a few of his mates. Continued to do the um, academy stuff with Bristol, but I went to Hartbury College on a scholarship because after I got let go from England, obviously I was fuming. Not let go from England, but I didn't get you into didn't the get 16s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Literally thought the world was over. Um, and a few boys in my position who got called and I thought were crap so i was like this is as it's working out yeah they're yeah not, do you know what i mean like me. it won't add enough but what were you like i mean i when i speak to some of these guys i speak to like michael owen as a football and other people they were very strong in their belief that there was going to be success awaiting them did you how steadfast were you in your belief that uh, 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 hang on you know i'm good enough to be here and i will be here and it's a moment it's just a moment in time until i get there I didn't really see it. You didn't no, see it? No, I didn't see it. My mum did. My mum was like, you're good enough, you're better than all these. But I thought, right. she's just being a mother. Do you know what I mean? She's just trying to fill me with confidence. My old man was the other way. He actually said, like, think about doing something else. Right. Because um, I was putting everything into it, everything that I was capable of in, in my capacity at the time. Um, trying to go for it as, as well as I can. I just fell short, obviously. And at 16 as well, 
you go through puberty and well, emotions are high. Do you know what I mean? You, you, ain't got, you ain't got a clue what's going on. So if you were unsure and your mother believes that you've got the talent and your dad's being level-headed about it and saying, give yourself a safety net, right? When did you look at it and go, hello, no, actually, I do have the belief in myself. So this off, is for me. Off and the I back of that, it. we went on a rugby tour with my club side, uh, Cainsham at the time, and that was it. And then just after that, there was a college called Hartbury where I went and played my my, my college rugby between 16 and 18. And apparently there was this scout going to watch Colston's, which is a private school in Bristol. And Cainsham organised a friendly against Colston's so that the scout, Alan Martinovich, great coach, coached me for, for years, was going to watch that game. And I wasn't going to play. Right. I wasn't going to play. But one of the players in that team, the private school, Colson's, got put into that England setup, and I didn't. Right. So I went, fuck it, I'll play. And I had an amazing game, scored tries, ran, ran a muck, you know? Right. And Alan, off the back of that, walked up to my mum on the side of the pitch and said, I'll give him a scholarship. He could come to Hartbury next year. And I was like, fucking hell. Right. And it was as simple as that. And then I went to Hartbury, which was a, at the time a breeding ground for internationals. We had 17 schoolboy internationals in in my age group alone. Um, and yeah, I just went from this player that was raw and low on confidence yeah. to it just woof, just transcended. Tell me about dyspraxia. I mean, you mentioned it a moment ago and how it impacted upon you at school because of the challenges you had with writing. But what about the challenges it would have for you in sport because it's a coordination challenge isn't it it's... it is yeah and it, the thing with dyspraxia is it can affect people differently so for me it's more judgment of space right. um so like for example my handwriting it wasn't like it wasn't very neat at all but i'd always write off the lines and, and stuff okay. like that i'd always walk in stores i'd drag my feet along the floor and my trainers were always rets and stuff like that so i had to I have a conscious effort to stop doing all those things with I was working with someone at school to to change it all. But when I played rugby, I barely passed anyway, if I'm being honest, right, because okay. I, I'm good at carrying. So I right. just thought, fuck, I ain't got to pass the ball, so I ain't got to work on right. that. But when I went to Hartbury, all these great coaches and players there, you, you actually spent time with cameras like this on slow-mo passing right. and learning how to pass. Before that, I'd done zero passing work ever. So I went there on a scholarship. I couldn't even pass the ball. Right. <laughs> but... um all these cameras and, that, and you, I worked it, I worked it, I worked it. I'm still not the best passer of the ball in the world now, but you get to a level where it suffices. And luckily in my position, I ain't got to pull strings all the time, so. But it's still there for you, isn't it? It's still Absolutely, something to yeah. the back of your mind, right? And I just wondered, did it, did it, for you as a personality, you've gone through this phase of doubting yourself, not being happy that other people have got opportunities to now believing in yourself. But this, this challenge, did it, was your personality one of using it as fuel to overcome it? Did it build extra motivation in you? Is what I'm trying to get to. Did yeah, you go like, I, like you say, use your expression. Fuck it, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do this. I, I'm, I'm fueled by at that time by anger. Yeah, I was gonna say I by rage. Yeah, by, by, by rage and. By the way, what anger and what rage? Just jealousy. Of I, what? Uh, everyone else, everything that they had, and the people that I was playing against, given ample opportunity and I was given fuck all so I always felt because I was sort of dragged through the dirt to get there right that I had to use what do you mean by that you mean you've got a loving family I've got a lovely great family support. so what, what are you being dragged through when you go to trials you were, look, you were looked at very differently for being from where I was from I didn't know anyone there right, right. so imagine this one of probably few mixed race people have turned up to this trial, which probably do I think they were thinking that? No, but I'm I'm different to them anyway. Right. I speak very differently to most people. Right. Uh with a thick southwest accent. Um I had a slit in my eyebrows, stars shaved into the back of my head, do you know what I mean? I'm in right. a full tracksuit. I ain't got gym shoes, all that all that sort of stuff. We've turned up right. in a O three four focus, do you know what I mean? So everyone else is in a nice Range Rover and that. So right. when I turn up automatically I'm blaring out Kanye West and Bob in my head and these kids are all in their right. groups already. So it's with, without being rude, no, it's fine. It's a little bit of an inferiority complex. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, I felt like I didn't belong, and that would make me think, "Fuck it, if I don't belong, I'm gonna show them why I should belong." Yeah. So, and that was my mum all the time, driving to all these trials. You fucking show them today. You let them know, and even if you don't get them, make sure they remember it and stuff like that. So, I, I still use it now, 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 now and again. Um, but I'd say that's more insecurities in performance. If I'm not playing well, I try to go back to that because. It then comes naturally, yeah. As opposed to thinking, because when I think, of when I think, I think that's when I start to probably drop off. You land at Bristol Bears, right? And you're in their academy. 
and I don't want to keep dwelling on the negative things, but but I think there's a, it's great to shine, look at the dark and shine the light on the successes. You find yourself in a situation where you're on the wrong side of the law mm -hmm. and you're getting yourself into scenarios that seem to be potentially taking away from the opportunity that you're creating from yourself. Mm. In your situation, what I've understood is that you've got involved with things you can tell me yourself if you want to um on the wrong side of the law whether that's drugs or or, or whatever else it is but you're on your journey mm. you're 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 in an academy you're on the way so and kel brook the fighter talked to me i said to him what, what, why do you get yourself in fights you're the wbc or ibf welterweight champion of the world, you're getting stabbed in Ibiza. Mm. How are you getting in situations like that? And he said something along the lines of, you can take the council house, you can take the boy out of the council house, but you can't take the council house out of the boy. Similar, we say you can right. take the boy out of the west, but can't take the west out of the boy. So what's going on with you then in this situation? Is it that? Yeah, I'd, I'd say similar stuff to that. And to be honest, I I think at the time, especially like you, you imagine, right, I've gone from, I've gone from sweet fuck all in terms of, never been in these professional environments, never been to these amazing facilities and that. And suddenly I'm chucked in it deeper and living away from home at the age of 16. All my mates are back home selling drugs, fighting, wearing nice clothes, buying shoes, uh, riding in cars at the age of 16. I'm seeing all this. Social media started to become a thing. And right. so I'm seeing all this. I'm thinking, fuck me, I don't even want to, I want to do that. You know, that looks fun. I'm here training at seven o'clock in the morning, four days a week and staying up here on weekends in Gloucester, a place I didn't necessarily call home, although I went too far away. Um, and then I got into the academy. I was getting paid, I think it was five grand to start with. And then we went in and said, look, I need, I need a bit more. So they gave me seven and a half grand a year. I had to fund my own driving lessons that the club didn't help us out with that insurance at the time for an 18 year old who had to put down legally professional rugby player was like four grand. So that's half my salary out the window mm -hmm. already, but they wanted you to be this well-oiled machine and, and buy all your grub and have discipline. But I was looking at my mates who were earning thousands of pounds selling drugs and right having a blast, going to parties, drinking, doing everything that I wanted to do. And I'm thinking, fuck me, I'm skin training right. to be a rugby player. I, I can't see the carrot. I, okay. I couldn't see a carrot, do you know what I mean? So where's the positive influences around you? Because the carrot is, you can see it in front of you. You can see it, this is 10 years ago, aren't we? We're talking about 10, 11 years ago? 12, yeah. 12 years ago. So we're talking about post England winning the World Cup. Rugby is a major sport. It's beginning to get a little bit money, more money in it. So where's the positive influence? Your parents would have been a positive influence in your they life. Were they? they were brilliant. They were brilliant. Yeah, they they deterred me from a lot of trouble. Yeah. Mum always first one to the cells to get me out whenever or take me down in some situations. Um, old man was a bit more to stick. Like he'd, he'd come down hard on me, but I think I needed it. Yeah. Needed that, um, which I think most young boys probably do need a positive male role model in their life. Um, and he was brilliant. But at the same time, you've got to remember he's working, he's self-employed, mm. trying to provide for my sisters, my mum, and everyone else. So he hadn't got time to be worried about me. Um, and then in their defense, my friends were brilliant. They were brilliant. They said, look, you ain't missing fuck all here. Like there's nothing yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah, it looks great, but think about it in the long run. So yeah, they pushed me away from a lot of stuff. Given given the fact that you captain, you end up as vice captain of England and captain of Leicester, would you consider yourself to be a leader or a follower because you're following people into a shitty way of life that, mm. that, that is taking them to tell you not to do it and i'm trying to establish because i mean i listening to you and you've got strong character watching looking at your career over the last three or four days and the things that you've achieved but you don't strike me as a as a follower yet the things that you're saying to me now suggest that at a time as a younger man you didn't know yourself and you might have been a bit of an easily led influenced ed led astray yeah I, I i've never i wouldn't say i've ever been a, f a follower i've always wanted to feel a part of something right that's what i've always craved i always wanted to feel a part of something i think that's why rugby took me so strongly right because obviously you're a part of a club you're a part of a team but i, w I was a part of a gang i was a part of these right. young we were 14 15 and i was a part of that and i felt these, these are my boys i don't never will never want to leave it i was so short-sighted in mm -hmm. where the world was. It, it didn't go outside of BS4 for me when I was younger. And then right. suddenly I've seen all these mental schools and all these mental right. cars, you know, that was that was what triggered it, I guess. Did that intimidate and, you? Did it, make, did, it, did it make you look at the, when you're looking at great wealth or what you consider to be great wealth by comparison, 
Did it intimidate you in any shape or form? Did it make you feel like you didn't belong? I, I used to call it putting the blinkers on. So when I turn up to someone and I feel like that, I'd literally just be like that. I wouldn't look at anyone, wouldn't keep, like keep eye contact with anyone, wouldn't chat to anyone, which obviously then all the selectors and that when I was growing up, it changes when you get to to the elite level, but they're all thinking, well, fuck me, this kid don't want to be here. Look at his body language. I had that for years. Poor body language, poor body language. And I think it was just because of the way I was, the way I looked, as opposed to what I was actually doing on the pitch, you know? Were you were you close to t stealing um, defeat from the jaws of victory? Because you're on your way now. You're in Bristol. You're, you're, you're getting yourself into a situation where people are recognizing your talents and this other side of things this period of time where you're getting the collar felt and you're getting pulled out of prison cells and whatever else you got were you close to missing the opportunity that you've now taken yeah i was, I was on a knife edge really we lost um one of our mates when we were 14 um to a hit and run and he actually played rugby and he loved it so every time we i would go back then i got one friend uh called luke who would say no do the rugby, do the rugby, do the rugby. I remember that when we were young. And I think that, that boys having that trauma, that impact on them, that's probably what made them keep pushing me to to leave it. But yeah, countless times. I mean, I got nicked four times in the academy at Bristol. I was on the only player I think ever in rugby to have a good behaviour bonus in their contract, which consisted of not getting arrested and not getting into fights at training. Do you know what I mean? I'm fucking <laughs> <laughs> Who the fuck has a five hundred pound bonus in their contract for, for not getting hit? Um, but that's where I was at. I was, I was just, and I think, like you said, I was battling with feeling a part of something. It wasn't until mm. I let my guard down and and really became invested in in a team that I started to see firstly success in rugby, and secondly, actually be a bit happier off the pitch. Yeah, you talked about not belonging. I mean, how difficult was it for you? to make sure that you use the emotion of whether it is anger or resentment or a feeling of being an outlier and an outsider to use that in the right way in sport. It, it, it was, it was tough because back then and similar to when I started to put the blinkers on, I, I just see red when I go on the pitch and I was so angry and, and ferocious and I was, I was getting into scraps in, in games and always at people and chirping and I, I was horrible to play against, but I wasn't channeling my energy in the right way. Right. So I worked with some sports psychs and to be honest, the, the, the best mentors for me were the players. Seeing other players and I don't know how familiar you are with them, but the, the South Sea Islander boys, all the Polynesian boys who are absolute yep. fucking animals. Right. And they hit hard, they carry hard, they are monsters, aggressive men, but they're so quiet and calm when they do it. Mm -hmm. They weren't letting people know, weren't leaving a bit on them, you know, yeah. like, whereas I was, and I had a mentor called Jack, mentor, called Jack Lamb, good friend of mine, lived with him. He was 27 at the time, I was 18. He paid my rent, put me in a place, paid for all my food. And he was like, look, I'll, I'll bring you in, but there's a few rules. He was like, you stop going out on the piss and getting arrested. You, And he was brilliant for me. So I owe a lot to Jack. Was, was leaving Bristol a key definer for the changing of your thought processes, moving you away from things that are around you and from some of the challenges and choices that you may have had and moving you somewhere else? Well, yeah, I think when I was at Bristol, as I said, I had that, that good behaviour bonus. And I, I think it was one step forward, two steps back. And I, I felt like I should have been playing, but I was very young at the time. And there were a few players playing ahead of me. And I remember the sort of turning point was we were in training. We were playing a conditioned game. And one of the players that was in my position slapped one of the other players. And I just thought, fuck it, I'm going to let him have a few. So I, I hit lumps out of him and he couldn't play that weekend because he had a cut under his eye. So I got brought onto the bench, made my debut. And then a the week later, they sent me on loan for a few weeks to get me out of there. And then the opportunity to Leicester came. Right. So you, you imagine now I'm I'm thinking I should be playing anyway. I've just played, made my debut. Now they've sent me on loan. All this is, is it, going on. Am, am I right in this? Because I'm going to ask you um, about the comment about stripped you back to the bow bones and ask you to tell me what that means. But I just want to get the chronologically right. You, you, you play for Bristol Bears. Mm. You then go out for loan for two seasons. One, I was on loan. You're on something called to dual, dual to registration. Clifton, right? Yeah, dual registration. So right. you, you've got a club that's local to Bristol in the National League, so yeah. a lot lower level, not professional. You go on, train with them, loan there, play there, then come into train with Bristol on the week. Then you train with them on the nights. Right. So it's full on. 
And I was on loan there for two seasons. But you, you, you seem to have gone into Bristol, made an impact. This is what I've read, mm. right? You made an impact. Then you go out and loan for what I thought was two years, and you say it was one year. I went and on, you come yeah. back to Bristol, make 14 appearances. Bang, Leicester come in for you. You go to Leicester, you make one appearance. Bang, you're in the England squad. Mm. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. You know, you, you don't seem to have spent an inordinate amount of time establishing yourself before you've got the next step almost offered to you instantaneously well yeah it went quickly for me so like like you said i, I debuted for bristol then i went on loan to plymouth and i was there for right. two three weeks they out one again they went into liquidation i remember being in the gym i got water up to my knees because right. it was flooded like it was it was a tough place to be and then leicester came with the offer um to buy me out of my contract but that was off the back of all the shit going on with me at the club in bristol and repeatedly getting arrested in the season yeah. and they were like I think they were at the time probably glad to see the back of me in the club's defense I did shake hands with with Chris Boy at the time the chairman of the club and he said like we'll see you back in the future and I was like yeah I, I feel like Bristol's my home I probably mm -hmm. will be back but Leicester at the time it was notorious for being hard-nosed and right. some of the toughest players to ever play the game Manu Tulangi, Tom Youngs all these big bruises of, of men so I've gone there, and now you think I've reset again now. Well, that's what I'm going to I'm going to read you back the quote again, which is what you said, which is I went to Leicester, and I got humbled very quickly. And I'm curious about that, because you sat here telling me that you struggled to fit in and found difficulty in being accepted and challenged yourself mentally. Um, and then you go on to say, I got stripped back down to the bare bones and built back up. So what does that mean? What does getting humbled mean very quickly? And what does it mean? So say you got stripped back down to the bare bones and built back up. Well, that year, so that was a 2015-16 season. I went out on loan. I played for England the 20s. We won the Six Nations, the under-20 Six Nations. Came second in the World Cups in New Zealand. I, I featured in that heavily. Thought I was playing really well. Um, so I thought, yeah, world's at my feet. I'm best player alive sort of thing. This young prospect. All Leicester Tigers want to buy me out my contract. How good am I sort of thing? Yeah. I turn up. Um, was I it an economically good move for you? Yeah, yeah. Was it good I, dough? What do I do? I tripled my salary. Right, okay. So I was on 20, 20 k at Bristol um, with that 500 pound good behavior yeah. bonus. And I went to Leicester for 40 and then 60, right. two year contract. So it was, it was brilliant money for a tw 21, tw yeah. 20 year old boy. Anyway, I've gone there. I thought, fucking, I'll be straight in the team. I'll play straight away. And yeah, I, I was very wrong. Um, I realized very quickly I didn't train hard. I played hard. I didn't train hard. Right. So I found out, yeah, very fast. And in my first week there, I got uh, I got filled in by about five of the senior boys in the training okay. session. So that was what I mean when I said I got humble because, like I said, I've come in. It was and, a reality check. Yeah, I was like, fuck, I'm a bad boy from Noel. You know, right. I thought my shit didn't stink. Went into training, yeah, and I got lumps it out of me. And then, right. uh, but the club was amazing. It was amazing because that happened and I was covered in claret. And Richard Cockrell, another lunatic, the coach at the time, come mm -hmm. up to me, said, brilliant, Genji. And I was like, fucking hell. I just got into a scrap with five of the boys my first week here. And the coach is saying, brilliant, if I did that at Bristol, I wouldn't be allowed to train for two weeks. You know what I mean? Right. So now I'm seeing people embrace me as opposed to try to sort of suppress what I love, the right. the fire, the passion, the fight. I loved it. That mm -hmm. was what I played rugby for. Um, and now this club wants to embrace it. So he come up to me, he said, brilliant. And then he, channel it. And then channel it. And yeah. he said, brilliant. Now you're going to hit the next scrum. And I was like, well, I'm covered in fucking blood. Can't I go and are you going to hit the next scrum? So I've gone into the next scrum. He went, nice. Now go get cleaned up. He brought me into the office. He said, mate, he said, what you're going to learn there very quickly is like, we love that. Like, we love the fire. We love the mm -hmm. fight. As long as you train hard, play hard, and you're not an all-bed, basically, um, we'll look after you. So, and so that did. gave you a sense of belonging, didn't it? Oh, mate, yeah. straight away. Like, even the boys who had just... Uh, it ten, ten shades of shit out of me. Um, they come up to me after shook my hand. Tom Young's uh, not club captain at the time. Ed Slater was. Tom Young sent me a text on the night, but I remember ringing my old man and telling him what happened. Um, and I was in Leicester now, two and a half hour, two and a half three hours away from home. And I, he was like, "Fucking hell, mate, straight away. Why are you doing that?" Blah, blah, blah. And then Tom Young sent me a message of a picture of his face, and he had a few bruises on his face from where we were fighting. And he went, "Call you caught me well, Bab. See you tomorrow." And I said to my dad, I said, he's just fucking text me. He was like, brilliant. He said, go in tomorrow. First thing you do, shake his hand. So I went and shook Tommy's hand. He, he went, just come off a Lions tour, do you know what I mean? He's one of the best mm. players in the world in his position. And he's saying that to a 20-year-old who's just come from a championship And now you're getting club. the acceptance you wanted as well, yeah. And I straight away, I just yeah, felt like I belonged. So mm. 
I then gave everything for the club for the for the foreseeable, yeah. And you started a relationship with Steve Borthwick. I did. He actually came to Bristol in 2015 and then left Bristol within I think three months, four months to then coach Japan with Eddie. Right. Nothing to do with your Sorry, bad behavior. He was coaching Japan. No, that was still my behavior. Although I did get arrested when Steve was there. <laughs> um, which probably wasn't a good start. Steve was with Eddie at Japan at the end of that World Cup cycle in 2015. Came to Bristol in the champ. We met. We well, I loved him. I don't know if he loved me at the time, but got on really well. He was a great coach. He then left to go to England. And then, as you said, six months later, I'd played, debuted against Bath, and I was in the England setup. So we we're working, working together since then. This relationship with Borthwick, I mean, he was the coach when you lifted mm. that premiership trophy. And I think I'm right in saying that you said when you first met him, I'm paraphrasing here, that you loved him. Mm. I mean, in terms of you respected of course, him yeah. and valued him, right? W why did you love him? What was that about? Because he, he gave me the time of day. And although at the first time we met each other, I was a delinquent in the academy, probably doing his head in, ruining training sessions. He he didn't treat me any differently to anyone else. He didn't see me differently to any of the other players. We had internationals at the club at the time, British and Irish Lions at, at Bristol at the time. But Steve would treat me with the same amount of respect that he treated them. Um, right. And it's, it's rare, I think, especially as an academy player in rugby, to to find someone like that. So automatically, I thought, I can know, I'll, I'll fight for this bloke. Mm. Yeah, that's good. You're a mainstay in England rugby squads. You're the captain of the uh, Premier League winning side. And you leave and rejoin Bristol. And not only do you leave and rejoin Bristol, you take a big pay cut. Why would you do that? I think, to be honest, and this isn't arrogance, it's, it's confidence. I, I almost knew that we were going to get that chance to, to lift that trophy. And Leicester offered me a, a, a three-year deal on great money. And I didn't accept it straight away. And I thought, why haven't I accepted a three-year gig with a club I love? I've been here six years. I've got a house up here. My my dog, my son's been born here. Missus is up here. My mum and dad love the club. We know it like the back of our hand. And ultimately, they, they gave me my success. Um, and I had to think about it. And that obviously... Brought up a few red flags. Um, right. Like what? Well, I went away and I said to my old man, I said, like, Lester, offer me your contract. He said, fucking hell, brilliant. Get in. Um, yeah, happy days. Um, it's all going so well. You're starting for England. You're captain of the club. You've got a chance to lift silverware this year. I said, yeah, but I don't know if I want to stay. And he was like, why? And my nan was ill at the time. Um, God rest her soul. Um, I had a few things going on with family and I could see that for my family at the time, and I'm sure you've had decisions to make like this yourself, for my family at the time, I knew deep down it would have been a selfish decision for me to stay in Leicester. It would have been a career-driven decision and ultimately possibly that would have probably gave my family better opportunities in the future. But for happiness away from sport, I knew that my family would be happier in Bristol. My son could be brought up closer to his grandparents and the mm -hmm. rest of his family, my nieces, my nephews, my missus, nieces and nephews. Um, I had a second child on the way. I wanted right. her to be brought up in Bristol. I know the area. Um, although I knew Leicester very well too. I knew that I'd always want to go back and the opportunity. They must have bit your arm off, mustn't they? Bristol. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult one. I'd, I'd the, Discussions well, maybe with not, them. And, maybe you have to pay the good behavior bonus. Exactly. And stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> it was a bit, bit, bit steeper at the time <laughs> yeah. as well. Um, but I had conversations with him in 2018 and 2020 and all, all, always tempted fate and almost got to, to the line with him to, to sign the paper. But the, the money wasn't right, if I'm being honest, at the time. Um, they had a great squad and they were they were doing really well. So they probably thought, well, fuck me, we don't actually need to pay through the roof for him. Right. And they finished 11th, I think, the year that we won the Prem or maybe 10th. Right. So they probably thought, fuck it, we need, we need someone. And Bristol are big, which I love, on having Bristolians playing for the club. Okay. Local talent playing for right. England. And I'm the only Bristolian playing for England. So for them, marketing-wise and business-wise, it's probably an easy decision. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as you said, I, I, I took, a, took a pay cut. It won, won hundreds of thousands of pounds, but I, I knew my family would have been happier. And for me at the time, I thought, fuck me, I've 
have a missus up here for years. My right. kid's been up here. I, I want them to go home and, and settle in now. And um, right move for you? Well, yeah, we're, for your rugby? we're teetering on playoffs now. So right. hopefully if the next few weeks go well, we'll uh, I'll get back to you. <laughs> Let me know. Can I ask you about rugby per se and the structuring of rugby? Do you think, I mean, Eddie Jones made some observations about the structure of rugby. And I kind of half agreed with what he said. And he got lambasted. He got slaughtered by the establishment when he turned around and said, if kids only come from private schools with that background, then they don't have the toolkit to overcome adversity because everything's handed to them, given to them in a certain way. And I kind of half understood what he was saying. And he got a lot of shit for it. And he didn't apologize for it. And he didn't back down from it. And I think if you say something, you mean it, you say it. Mm. Um, and you stick by it. And, and he did something. We sat here and talked to me. He, he stuck by the same principles. I agree with it. And I agree that if you if you if you don't have adversity in your life and everything is handed to you, even though rugby to me is a fucking difficult sport, mm. um, then you then you lose out on a certain set of characteristics, that ability to dig deep. Do you think rugby's got a bit of a class problem? It's definitely got a class problem. Yeah, yeah. What it's, do you mean by that? Well, I've seen it firsthand. Um, over the years, as, as I said, when I was going to, to the trials and stuff. So at, at a younger age, the kids who miss out on becoming a professional rugby player, I would say is massively down to the class divide uh, in, in the sport. It's it's really tough to explain unless you've seen it first time because- Do you mean class divide, divide because of the Absolutely, money? yeah, financially. I'm, I'm yeah. strictly talking, yeah. talking financials. I think if you're a nice enough bloke and you, you ain't causing problems anywhere you go, you get an opportunity yeah. if you're nice enough and you 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 get on with everyone you're, you're going to get a chance yeah. but in terms of I, i'm talking rugby boots for example yeah. and and all the kit and the hours that you got to drive the festivals the schools because yeah. ultimately the private schools got the best facilities the best coaches yeah. go and, and coach there they're going to produce better talent i get that but athletically and in terms of raw talent i, I know where that is I know where the the raw aggression, the the natural talent, the the kids who are hungry to get out of where they're from. I, I know where that is, and that is in the in the areas that are deprived. So, but did the sport? I mean, because because it, it's interesting in football, and it's a comparison between when you've got highly educated, what seems to be highly educated, coming from well heeled backgrounds, they get ridiculed and out and sort of ostracized in football so mm. i'm thinking of graham lasso yeah. are you saying that the polar opposite exists in rugby if you don't come from elite background you didn't go to one of the elite schools your parents don't drive a range rover and you you know you you aren't as well educated perhaps as someone that's been through the private school system that you have the same experience yes definitely when i was growing up but i i experienced it first hand. I, I don't necessarily know if it's like that anymore because it's been highlighted i think people probably have have recognized it and it's changed a little bit the dynamic has changed right what what i would say in in football is when you're young and i i'm not too clued up on it but i, I see people get signed at eight years old nine years old yeah. ten years old right their talent because the infrastructure is there their talent id and the infrastructure yeah. is grassroots yeah. from the bottom they know if there's a good player playing for a club from six seven eight right Whereas in rugby, you find Alex Dombrandt, I'll give as an example. I think he signed his first contract after he finished university at 22, I think. And he's one of the best number eights in the premiership now. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that talent ID isn't necessarily there. The pathways are very different. I don't think you'll find one of the best players in the premiership in football having to have gone to university and get scouted there and, and mm -hmm. do it the hard way in that sense. Um, so I, I think the infrastructure at the bottom of the game in rugby is needs a lot of work, but it needs funding but that that's sense. money in it. do you know what i mean that's money so do you think do you think that um eddie jones was right i'll read what he says right and then i'll quote it to you and see if you think there's an advantage in the way that you came through if you've only been in a system when you where, where you get to 15 said jones you have a bit of rugby ability then go to harrow then for two years you do nothing but play rugby everything's done for you that's the reality you have this closeted life when things go to crap on the field Who's going to lead? Because these blokes have never had any experience of it. I see this as a big thing. When we're on the front foot, we're the best in the world. When we're not on the front foot, our ability to find a way to win our resolve is not as it should be. So what he's basically saying is when the going gets tough, you know, people the don't get, get going, going if they haven't cut. Yeah, exactly. Would you say that there's any resonance in that? And would you say, given your experiences in life, it actually puts you in a better position than the people that Eddie Jones is pointing at. 
You follow me? I understand exactly what you're saying. I think Eddie's one of those. He's he's one, he's he's similar to myself. He, he didn't he didn't get everything handed to him. He uh, he spoke openly about experience in race and when he was growing up in Australia and he played in a tough league over there. And he actually played at Leicester as well in the front row, which uh, was a tough position to play in the in the era that he played in. So I think Eddie had a, a rough ride in. Um, so naturally, as a coach, he probably favours the people who are abrasive, mm -hmm. um, aggressive, and, and front foot things. What I will say on the situation is, some. But he's of, not saying that. He's actually. On. He's basically saying that when you've come from this public school background, when you've got a silver spoon and you've been given everything, you've got. He's kind of saying. You got no bollocks when it comes down to it. When the going gets tough, you need people that have got the ability to overcome adversity. And if you've been given everything and everything comes from a privileged background, you might have the toolkit, you might have the physical attributes, but you haven't got this mm. when it gets going. The mental nose. Yeah. I, I know what it means. And it's because he's when he's coaching the gen I think the generation's different now. Like when I was younger, as I spoke about being in the academy at a club, you got you got given fuck all. Um it, it was hard, you know. The senior players won't even fucking look at you most of the time until you weren't your stripes. Whereas now Are you better for it? Of course I am, yeah. So that means that you've got an advantage. So, so I think it's it's been failed almost yeah. um, within reason. And I think what Eddie's speaking about is some of the kids that came through and, and got given opportunities very early probably didn't have that mental resilience of getting knocked back a few times and having to get back up, getting knocked down again, mm -hmm. and then getting dragged through, as I said, you know. Um, but some of the best players in the in the world have, have come from the background that he's talking about, and they're fucking lovely blokes as yeah. well. And I love playing with them. Yeah. So... It's not it, one size fits all. No, it's it? not. No. But I, I totally understand what you're saying. Even me now, like when I see some of the youngsters and I chat to them, I think, fuck me, mate, you've got a big shot coming your way. Um, just it, they fail once and they, yeah, like you said, they, yeah. they don't Can't know get what, yeah, like a rabbit in headlights, they know what's going on. What about representation in the sport? I mean, you made an observation during um, the BLM time when everything was prevalent um, with Black Lives Matter being on the news everywhere. You talked about the issue in rugby as it's been a white man's game for a number of years. Mm. There's not really many, certainly in this country, I think you're probably referring mm. to, aren't you? Um, there's not really many black coaches or ethnic coaches, especially in England. I don't think people are commercialised, especially the black and African boys in rugby or women. To be icons, we're not presented like that. What do you mean by that? Well, what I think what, what I was alluding to, and I spoke briefly earlier about Lloyd Russell, the teacher yeah. that came to my school and the impact yeah. that had on me, having a, a black teacher at the school who, who could relate to instances that I've been through. Did you need to see it to be it? Is that what you're saying? Growing up, I, I didn't know any black rugby players. You know, right. there was, to be fair, there was Paul Sackey and Jason Robinson and Courtney Laws, obviously. Fuck yes, me, of course, what, a, yeah. what a man. But I, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Um, you see a lot of the Golden Boys, Lawrence D'Alia, uh, mm -hmm. Johnny Wilkinson, mm -hmm. Will Carlin, all these players being poster boys. And I think that the times are changing. Like you think of Mauro Toji, he's one of the biggest names in, in rugby in, in general. And he's doing amazing things commercially in the game. But, for me growing up, I think what I was referring to then, and obviously I had a lot of fucking time to think because we were all locked in doors, weren't we? So um, what I was saying is when I was growing up in rugby, I, I, I didn't have any people that I looked up to and thought, fuck me, I could see myself there because no one had opened up about going through what I'd been through or coming from a similar background to me or not many people who were mixed race playing rugby who, who mm -hmm. looked like me, you know? So whereas in football, fuck me, there's a lot of representation, isn't there? And Indeed. to be fair, I, I would say in football as well, it don't matter where you're from. If you're if you're mint, you're you're is, gonna get a gig. Is there is there is there a representation issue in rugby because of racism, or is there just a representation an issue in rugby because people aren't represented enough? Is racism at the centre of that? Do you think? No, I think it's class. It's class. I think it's class. Yeah. All right. I think it's class. I think that's what it whittles down to every time. Money. Do, do you believe there'll be a pathway within the confines of your sport? Just about talent. Well, I think to be honest, the sport's quite openly been on its ass for a while, especially in the financial department. So if they haven't got the money to build on the infrastructure and the resource at the bottom of the game, then that's just never going to happen gonna anyway. Be a yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I think there needs to be a distinct plan. I'm, I'm similar to you. I don't think we need to make a big song and dance, but we need more black players. It's, it's not what I'm asking for. What I'm asking for is equal opportunity at both yeah. ends of the diet. Whether yeah. you've got a load of dough to start with or whether you've got fuck That's all. That's fair enough, yeah. Let's look at both sides of the coin, do you know what yeah. I mean? Let's not just gear everything towards these private schools and just yeah. go there to find the talent. Let's go to the shitholes. Let's go mm. to North West and, and try and find... Yeah, let's, there, let's, you've got a different brand let's do it. Not just mm. because it's hard to do. I know it's harder to do. Mm. But that's why you caught a diamond in the rough, you know? Mm. Like that's where you find them. Absolutely. How did you feel representing your country? 
I'll be honest with you, mate, it, it happened so quick. I didn't actually think about it. Um, I debuted for Leicester a few months before. My whole life had changed. I just moved up from Bristol and then I got called into England squad after the semi-final. Richard Cockrell didn't tell me until the night before we were meeting up. And that was at about eight o'clock. Eddie rang me and went, Ginch, now this is, mate. And I was like, no. Eddie fucking Jones. And I was like, wait. <laughs> is that what you said? <laughs> Eddie fucking Jones? Yeah, fuck it, why not? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he's a legend. <laughs> and... Um, I honestly thought someone was going to start laughing. I thought it was a wind up. Right. And he said to me straight up, he went, look, I'm going to bring you into camp, mate. He was like, I love what you're about. I love the fight. I love the aggression. Bring it with you. So I did. And played against Wales. Debuted and then went on the Australia tour. Yeah. And didn't play a minute for five weeks. So that's what I mean when I say it was a roller coaster. I didn't have much time to... Because I was going to ask you about that because, I mean, Eddie was on here and he was a riddle wrapped up in an enigma, right? I sat here asking him, you're going to be the Australian coach? Yes, mate. You're not leaving Australia because all these things have been indexed to you going to Japan. No, mate. I said, categorically, you're gonna, I'm going to stay in Australia as long as they want me. He does the podcast next day, fucking resigns and goes to Japan. Right? So he's a riddle wrapped up in an enigma and he's a fascinating character. But he calls you up into the squad, but he doesn't seem to play you. You know, I look at your statistics. I think it's something like out of the 38 times you could have been available to pay, play for Eddie Jones. You only start 19 of those games. And I think 10 of them or nine of them were in his last set of fixtures. So prior to that, you're starting like one in four. Yet when Steve Borthwick takes over, you're starting 80% of the games. What's that about? I think naturally Steve's taken over at a later stage of, of, of my career. So I'm probably a more senior player now, um, as you said before, achieve what we did with Leicester and had that working relationship. Um, with Eddie, there was already established players there um, that had just won a Six Nations title with him. And those boys were there to stay for the time being, whether I was... Was it nothing to do with he didn't have enough confidence in you? It was, it just, I, was it just timing? I think that. I think you always got to show a coach. Um, right. Uh, why they should pick you and it's not good enough just doing it in in the prem you've got to do it week in week out in training and then perform when you get the opportunity and at test level like you you need to have experience um i never used to believe that but uh, right. you, you really do so i actually i never used to understand it but the the older i got and the more he started playing me the change i've seen in myself as a firstly as a man um and secondly as a player i actually started to understand the conversations we'd have we'd always sit there at the end of a week or at the beginning of a week, he'd send you home on a Tuesday to go play for your club if you weren't going to play for England. Back then, with Eddie, he'd say to me, mate, you're not playing this week. And I'd be like, fuck me. I'm playing my best rugby in the Premiership, so that's like the only place I can show you. I'm training the ice down, where I felt I did. Um, I ain't getting arrested. And I'm still not getting picked. Like, what the fuck's going on? I'd have some... Eddie, I'll tell you if you ever see him again. I've had some very open conversations with mm -hmm. him in uh, in that meeting room. We, we've clashed heads a few times once, quite literally. And... Um, he always say, mate, you're not yourself. I can't pick you. You're not being yourself. You're not yourself. Uh, you look low on confidence, man. I'd be like, what the fuck you want about it? Like, you, you don't know any of this. I'm full of confidence. I am myself. I am myself. And he was right. He was right for all those years. I right, used to, yeah. yeah, he was right. He was right. And I used to give him a fucking hard time about it. So if he does watch it, sorry, Eddie, because I used to fucking chew your ear off about it. But um, he was right. Uh, he was, yeah, he was totally right. Well, that brings me on to a, an interesting dynamic that I... I found really challenging for my thought process when I was talking to Lawrence Delalio about players and their relationship with coaches. And it's manifested itself recently, I think, with Henry Slade talking about you players and your propensity to tell the coach. And I think Lawrence used this expression, we're, we're the ones going out in the fucking field getting our face smashed in. We've got a view on how this should be. Mm. And I'm curious to see how that manifests itself. In football, you've got the coach. He determines the philosophy of how mm. you play. Right? And that's kind of at the end of the discussion. And if you don't fit into the coach's requirements, you go. off you go. Whereas it seems to be, certainly from what Lawrence was saying to me about the attitude of the England squad at that time and what they would say when they felt that there needed to be something to be said and how they'd want to change. And then I'm reading this bit about what Henry Slade has said about how it was basically the players 
that have impressed upon the coach the necessity for change in the Ireland game. You tell me. Yeah. Did he? I think he's referring to the Scotland game where we lost and then we played the Ireland game the week after having done those changes. Is that what, what he's he talking said about? was there was a flip made from the coaching team with England to dedicate a lot more time in the week to attack. And you definitely saw the benefits in that in the Ireland game. Yeah, so but he's played, attributing that to. Yeah. I think the headline was, and I think the headline was a bit of a mis, um, uh, a misrepresentation. Uh, player revolts. <laughs> yeah, I definitely want a revolt. Uh, that I want a part of it anyway. Um, so in in the Scotland game, we basically coughed up the ball twenty two times, unforced errors, turnovers, dropped the right. ball, um, and we lost the game. Um, I think by six points. So we had two weeks essentially to prepare for this Ireland game. And I think I wasn't involved in this. I'm in the brain stress with the front row, not the uh, not with the backs. But I think they basically went in and said, look, we need to change something. Um, and Slade's a great player and he moves the ball so well. So he probably did front foot that. I'm, I'm not too sure I went in the discussion. But we then went out and trained and spent, I think it was 50% more of our time in training on attack. And yeah, you, you, you've seen it come through. What I will say about that is that if, if we didn't lose to Scotland in that week, we wouldn't have made those changes. Right. So every cloud as they say like we, we wouldn't have changed and we i don't know if we would have beat ireland or not but we the performance we put in was definitely off the back of thinking fuck me let's have a look at ourselves but culturally is it is it a different is it a dynamic where the players are able to really express their views about certain things so what i will say is i think and it sounds a bit cliche but everyone in rugby always talks about the environment being good do you have a strong leadership group? Is everyone comfortable to speak up? And I've been a part of teams in the past where people say, yeah, we do have a good environment. We do have a strong leadership group. We are we are comfortable to speak up, but no one fucking did. Right. And when you lost, people still didn't speak up because they were scared about what coach was going to say. I think Steve created an open form when he came in. He's right. He's, 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 I've worked with him for ages, so I knew it. And I had to reinforce it to some of the boys because they weren't too sure. But... He genuinely wants to learn. If if you think something can be done better, he'll, he'll sit there and he'll listen to you. If right. you don't agree with you, he'll tell you. Mm -hmm. But he's not his ego doesn't get hurt in that sense. Um, so I think when when that did happen against Scotland and we kept losing the losing the ball, I think the boys probably went to him and said, "Steve, we need to do this," and he he implemented it. So it's a sign of a good coach, I think. Like you said in football, like I, I don't know it too well, but like Pep and, and and those boys, I can't imagine if I went into his office and said, "Look, Gaffer." I need to play up front this week. I think he, I, I don't know how it yeah. works, but he'd, he'd probably lose a plot, wouldn't he? Mm. Whereas I think in definitely in the environments that I'm in now, it's a bit of an open form. Was Eddie good at having these sort of conversations with players where he's getting um, getting a directive from players or certainly some significant input? You I mean you talked about bumping heads with him because he was saying something to you that he didn't agree with. But as a coach, I mean, I like him as a man and I liked him as a coach and, and, I, and I don't really recognise some of the things in the media. I do think he's a trickster and a bit tricky, uh, but I don't like some of the things that Clive Woodward writes. He seems to be constantly sniping Yeah, you're all not the alone time. there, mate. You're not alone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why does it annoy you what he says? Um, I genuinely don't read after stuff because it's behind a paywall and I refuse to <laughs> pay one pound to listen to it. So right. I never read the article. I see a few headlines and he says he says a lot of stuff. I think like rugby's changed drastically in what's it been, twenty one years since he, he won the World Cup mm -hmm. in England. So in that twenty one years you've seen the difference in players and mm -hmm. the size, speed, agility. Everything Physical is gone structure. It's gone through yeah. the roof, you know. Like when I played I would have been a short fat prop now I'm six foot one and one of the quicker players on the team so it's not a it's not the same game um and I think he obviously he won a world cup so fuck me what can we say yeah. to him? Do you know what I mean like is that is that does that hang over you guys I think it, what, what what I'm acutely aware of is people they have to stay he has to put food on the table don't he? I'm sure he got a lot of dough from winning the world cup but he has to stay relevant and ultimately headlines like that do draw clicks and do draw attention and players will see it whereas if you went yeah England had a seven out of ten game this week. They were good. No one fucking clicked it, would they? Mm. So I, I understand it within reason, but at the same time, you have to understand. You, you make your bed, you sleep in it. You can't say that and then think you're everyone's fucking mate, you know? Because if you do talk about people in the press and 
and scrutinize people that that's what's gonna happen i had it recently um semi-final of the world cup the scrum penalty went against me um and there was a bit of controversy about it and ultimately that was the three points that was we lost by points mm. so you do the maths um and that fucking hurt me you know and then in the week now i'm seeing people that speak to me with a smile on their face say all sorts online so when i seen them I, oh, right. okay. I just i just said i said don't fucking speak to me i said i've seen what you put out in the week i said don't that my mate now and they shit themselves so like that's people got to do that to to earn their bread and but for me like if you're a like i ain't having it you know so but if it's a fair opinion it is fair it is fair so you wouldn't have a needle with it then would you if no, it's fair, I, if it's it's fuck it. I couldn't care less it's, if it's your job it doesn't mean i gotta like it it yeah. could be a fair opinion that mean it sits well with me that you're gonna you're gonna say the things that you said and to be fair <laughs> saying fair a lot there but i think people can word it in a certain way and when like you said people can can paraphrase things and and put headlines that yeah. are very different to the actual arc one like i said i ain't paying a quid to read it so um i probably miss a few things and I've, I've settled it with them since but i think it's easy for people to to pick people apart when when things go wrong and very rarely do we hear the press talk about england doing well can you tell me how you prepare for games i'll tell you why i'm asking Again, it's, a, it's it's comparison to another sport, and because these sports, I know it's not like boxing, but the physical contact that goes in rugby is significant. But the more I see it, and the more I speak to you guys, the more I like about it because I like the characters, I like the substance of the fellas. When you spend your time around footballers that roll around every five seconds because someone trod on their toe, it gets on my nerves a little bit. Yeah, and they walk yeah. around like impending doom getting 200 grand a week like the world's on their fucking shoulders it irritates me a little bit mm. um but what i was actually asking was this pre pre preparing and this preparation on fight week when you're talking to a fighter they're irascible they're bad tempered they're on their edge right what's the mentality of a, a top flight rugby player going into big games with the nature of the sport that you're in which involves you know, pain and challenge and physical adversity. Is there any parallel between the spikiness and the mental approach yeah. and the edginess of a fighter with that of a rugby player? I think definitely, but it's position dependent. I think um, for me, front row is, is combative, it's, it's abrasive. You're, you're probably going to get a bang on the nose in the first minute of the game because you're in a ruck or yeah. you're going to get whacked, you know? Um, so I think naturally you have to be quite abrasive, and I think the best players in those positions are. Um, so a, a young, a young version of myself, I'd watch Mike Tyson clips on yep. the way to games. You know, I'd sit there watching Mike Tyson videos. Um, but that's changed for me now. Um, having more of a leadership role, um, I can't be that. Sat there not saying fuck all. No one knows what's going to happen. Bit of a ticking time bomb. Um, so I've changed that now and I'm, I'm a lot more relaxed because I've realized that the energy that I give off to other people will affect the way they play, rightly or wrongly, whether it should do or it shouldn't. Right. Um, it does. Uh, and people look to me for reassurance, I guess, because of that abrasiveness and that side to the game. They want to know right his head's on it as opposed to, mm. fuck me, this lunatic sat there watching Mike Tyson put people on the canvas for 15 minutes on the bus. What's going to happen, you know? <laughs> um, and I, I get it. And uh, because other people don't like getting fired right up they like being relaxed there's a kid he called joe marchant right i don't know if you know him he plays for plays for played for harlequins he was in the england setup he's in stade francais now over in paris mate he would be quoting uh you watched the film the other guys mm -hmm. and you know when he says uh nine thirty gentlemen let's have a great day he said that on the way out in the quarterfinal of the world cup and i was like what the fuck yeah. Well, I'm so far away from yeah, that, yeah. but he was he's incredible. What a yeah. player, do you know what I mean? Like he'd go out and he'd be the best player on the pitch. So I can't knock him for that. So mm -hmm. I think that's where you've got to understand the the differences in people's psyche and, and where mm -hmm. they're at and really get to know your teammates because some players, George Martin, for example, the big second row mm -hmm. from, from Leicester, he hits people harder than anyone's seen it. I can I can slap George on the back yet, I can grab him by the scruff of the neck, you know, and give him a bit of that. Whereas there's other players back three players, fly ass, scrum ass, not so much the physical part of the game. It's more of a, come on boy, I need you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm looking in the eye, I, I need you today, as opposed to the physical touches. So I think very long winded answer for, for your question, but I, I think that's the, the differences now in, in rugby. What did you make of Owen Farrell's challenges recently? I mean, he wasn't 
in the Six Nations. Um, he's taking a break from international rugby to prioritise his words, his and his family's mental well-being. Mm. What, what, you know, he's one of your colleagues, your captain. Yeah, and a good friend. What did you um, make of that? I, it was it was it was tough. I probably knew it was sort of looming over him anyway because I've asked him like, "You're right," and he'd be like, oh, "Mate, don't bother me," you know. Um, and you just you take everyone's word for it. And I think I think it's good for Faz. Like he's he's always ever known as England and England rugby. He's never been dropped in mm -hmm. the England setup. And for him to take a step back from it and go away, he's probably going to come back a better player. Do you know what I mean? So, and the one thing that doesn't sit well with me is he, he was always everyone's public enemy number one. Like if he done something wrong, everyone would fucking jump down his throat. And yeah. it's easy to attack him because he hasn't got a massive social media presence. He won't go back at people and in the media because he thinks like, nah, fuck it, I'll let my play and do the talking. And he's one of the best in the world. So I, underst I understood his stance, but sometimes, fuck me, you just want to stand up and just be like, have a pop for him, you know? Um, but look, people that jump off a cliff for that bloke when they were playing, like he's a big motivator. He'd work all day for you and rightly so, one of the best in the world in his position. So do you expect it, him to be back with England? Yeah, I can see him in England shirt. Yeah? Yeah, I can, yeah. How old is he now? 31, 30, maybe 32. Once he signed two years probably in, in France, he could be he could be back, definitely. But naturally when you're away from it and in England, unfortunately we got this rule that I think's not too sharp, is that when you go abroad you can't then play for your country mm -hmm. because obviously, as you'd know in football, you've seen Jude Bellingham and yep. those players yep. go away to the to the other leagues and made them who they are today. So I think that rule uh should change personally. But it was, it was brought in, wasn't it, to develop young talent and make sure it stayed on these shores. And I, I got that. But when now it's not working because of the finances and rugby. The finances and like, yeah. I think three, three, two or three teams have folded, right? So now there's less teams. So now these young players, both ends of the spectrum, the best players haven't got enough teams to go to because you can't, you got a cap and there's a, quite a mm -hmm. small one financially in rugby. And then the young talent don't get a chance to come through because now all the best players are condensed in, in one place. So, for me, it's just uh, yeah. But the primary motivation, work. isn't it? Let's be honest. For these players, to go and play abroad is the finances. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I, I say this in, I can imagine it was a big, big part of the the reason I went to the French league as opposed to I don't know a Japanese team mm -hmm. or something because the rugby in France at the moment is is the best. Do you blame them for putting? I mean, they're putting their finances, and you've done the polar opposite. You've made a decision to go from um, Leicester back to Bristol because of the principles of the value that you have for the for the, for the family unit that you need to be around more and, and, and what you believe is valuable in your life. So you've put finances a little bit lower down the food chain. Mm. Do you blame them? Because playing for your country is one of those just remarkable things that only a few people can actually get to. Yeah, and it's not always guaranteed. I mean, for... Owes it probably was, but for some of the other players who have made those decisions, it probably wasn't always guaranteed. And like I said, to be honest, their hands were probably forced because, like I said, there's three less, less teams in the league. Yeah. Um, so now there's not enough money. There's that's 15 million less on the cap to, to right. go around. There's only one marquee spot now. So if mm -hmm. you want a big overseas sign and you can't have a, an English player as a marquee, and teams don't want England players really because we're away for half the season. The structure's changed now. Right. I don't know if you've seen it, but the whilst the internationals were on, the Prem wasn't playing, yeah. which suits in, yeah. English clubs down yeah. to the ground. But then you've got to think about the knock-on effect of the players is you come back from camp and you just played seven weeks for, for your country, boom, you straight back into clubs. So, fuck me, it's, a, it's an uphill battle, isn't it? Do you think England are going to win a World Cup anytime soon? Well, 2027 is the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, like the the... One just gone in 23, what an opportunity we had. We lost by a point. We we're leading mm. for a majority of the game. So I, I, do, I do think that like the adversity and the, the hardships of a, a team do make them better. So Of course. I they think can overcome them and learn from them. You look at South Africa 2015, they got knocked out in the group stages, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And then they went on to win two on the bounce. So yeah. I think we've done 2015, got knocked out in the stages at home World Cup I wasn't a part of that 2019 semi-finals 2023 semi-finals exactly yeah. and then 2019 2019 final 23 semi so bronze silver knockout in the did pool. you guys feel the ambivalence from the nation what does ambivalence ambivalence mean? means kind of 
well, we, we think you're going to stink the World Cup out. You went into the back of this last oh, at the World beginning. Cup. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you feel that when you were over there? Yeah, in a big because way. Because it was this low level of expectation. But like I said, like if you go to a if you go to a restaurant, nine times out of ten, people only leave a bad review if it is shit. If you get like a if it's okay, then they don't really pipe yeah. up, do they? So I mean, like you always see the yeah. all the grief and all yeah, the yeah. Basically, if you go to a restaurant and you have a good meal, one person says something about it. If you go to a restaurant, have a bad meal, ten people say they're something all going to pipe up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. you you always see the the bad. You never really see the the good. The filter's not there. So I, I can imagine there were loads of fans that were always behind us and and supporting us. But we only and it, fuck me, it's tough. Like you lose at home to Fiji. It's never mm -hmm. never happened before. Suddenly, all the bullets are flying, but. It's crazy because in camp we were like, "Fuck it, we know we know where we're at. Mm -hmm. We know what we're building towards. We got the evidence to prove it." And I think we shut a lot of people up. And then on the flip side of the, what was the word? Ambivalence. Yeah, disinterest. On That's the flip, what it means, on yeah. the flip people side of the, um, the ambivalence, yeah. we then seen everyone get behind us, and it was yeah. it was amazing. Yeah. Like we've really felt that. So it was nice to see the tides turn. But we had to show them, didn't we? Because yeah. I'd be the same. Like if if my team's losing at home and they never lost to a team that routinely you should beat especially at home and you're saying that you're going to win a world cup then i'd have some questions to ask as well so i understand it but i quite like the idea of embodying it and using it as a as a motivator right. as opposed to trying to ignore it you know mm. last question for you you were on a netflix series did you enjoy doing it and do you see yourself doing any kind of sequels anytime soon <laughs> you know guy richie moving next year <laughs> yeah. um did I enjoy it? I didn't enjoy it at the beginning. I was really standoffish. Right. Um, I didn't want anyone to come into my home. I didn't want anyone right. to come to my house. I wasn't comfortable sharing um, anything to do with my family. Um, weirdly enough, I started filming shortly after that, my own documentary. Oh, did you? Yeah, but you can imagine I spent a lot more time getting to know the people that I'm filming right. with, with them, as opposed to Netflix texting you saying, can we come down today? It, it was tough to start with, but look, I, I think people enjoyed it, and I think this second season is is, is coming uh, next year, in the next year, and I think it's going to be even better. So hopefully, I I understand the value that it has for our sport, and I want I want rugby to do well. And I think like it hasn't been well documented over the years, and it's probably why it's failed to Cut sort through. of come off the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in short, yeah, I've I've enjoyed it because of what it's doing, but the process was a bit a uh, bit of a sticky one for me. Well. Done all right today. But now we're here, yeah. yeah. Look at me now. Ellis. Sweating my tits off. Very much enjoyed it, mate. Thanks for being so upfront. Top man, with me. thanks for having well me. Done, mate. Cheers. Upfront with me, Simon Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. For new weekly shows, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find audio episodes on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly.